not even with the official introduction. I've just got to say, for me getting to see the classes in the background, and we start that music, uh, Avoca West was like the Harlem Shake. Like, it was just bedlam instantly for the entire 30 seconds, and it absolutely makes my day. So thank you, guys. Madam Poff, too. You're a grooving teacher. Um, folks, welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. My name is Jesse. I'm your virtual adventure guy here today, and I'm so excited you're joining us as we continue our mission of bringing the world's coolest scientists, explorers, and places to classrooms like you every single day for free. Uh, this has been such an incredible month. February is classically our entire month dedicated solely to women in science and exploration. The International Day for Women in STEM is February 11th, and we spend the entire month featuring incredible stories from, I think, 15 countries over the course of the month. It's been a really, really diverse uh, start to 2023 generally, and I hope you get the chance to check them all out at our YouTube channel as well. Now today we continue a trend that we've been on for our last little bit. We've been doing a lot of Arctic programs. We've gone up to see the polar bears. We've done a bunch of things with belugas, and we are going to continue with the literal great white whale today. With Alexander Mayet, she is going to tell us a little bit about her amazing work in plains studying beluga populations from above, trying to understand this incredible creature in the Beaufort Sea, one of the most remote and amazing regions on this planet, right here where I am in Canada. And I am so excited to turn it over to her to blow your minds with all the cool stuff she gets to do. So without further ado, Alexandra, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you hey. so much for joining us. And uh, I can't wait to learn more about what you get to do. It sounds like the best job in the world. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, let's see. You guys must be ready for March break, isn't it? We are. We're getting. We're getting there. <laughs> Fully but surely approaching March break. We're going to relax. Wait, wait, wait. Going on a little vacation. <laughs> we can change the wait, wait. The screen, screen share likes to mess with the. <laughs> I did see my PowerPoint before. Now I don't see it. Okay, let's. Last place you look. Oh, no, there we go. There it goes. Almost there. And beautiful. You are like, All right. if, you, if you want to press hide on the stream yard, sharing your screen on the bottom. Yes. There you go. Perfect. Okay. You know, All good. <laughs> All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to, to talk to you this morning. Um, so we're going to talk about counting beluga whales in the Arctic today. Okay. So this is me. Uh, my name is Alexandra. Um, I'm a marine biologist. And uh, throughout my school and my work, I've worked with uh, very different uh, species uh, or creatures in the sea. So from weird looking sea cucumbers, uh, but really interesting creatures um, to more majestic belugas and big whales. I've also worked with narwhals and now I'm working with the North Atlantic right whales. Um, I'm here in St. John, New Brunswick right now. Um, but just to explain you a little bit of my, my background, so you may have noticed I have a little accent, and that's because I grew up in Gatineau in Quebec, so uh, French is my first language, and I learned English at school. So this is me when I was young, and as you can see, Gatineau is not very close to any ocean or big sea, so to me, marine biologist was not really a, a a big um, job that I, I wanted to do, but it was when I started going on vacation by the beach and uh, by the ocean that I really found that the ocean and the, the sea creatures really interesting and I wanted to learn more about them. So I went to the university in Rimouski, um, which is another city in Quebec, um, where I did marine science. And this is where I actually worked with the sea cucumbers. So this is my, my little hen with holding a sea cucumber. But when I finished school, I actually uh, wanted to learn more. Um, so I decided to do a master and I went all the way to the university in Winnipeg in Manitoba. So this is me. And when I was in the university, I was tasked to go count how many belugas were in the Beaufort Sea. So if you don't know the Beaufort Sea, it's all the way up there uh, in the Arctic. So I had to fly uh, to Inuvik, which is a, a little communities in the Northwest Territories. And this is me with my big parka because it's pretty cold up there. But before we go uh, and talk more about uh, counting belugas, let's just talk about belugas because they're cool creatures. Um, so just in general, there's two families of whales. Um, we have the baleen whales, 
which um, are the big whales that have baleen plates. So baleens are made from the same materials as your fingernails and your hair. And they have a lot and lot of them, uh, which allows them to filter a large quantities of little creatures like krill. On the other hand, we have the toothed whale. So this is, as you can see on the picture, whales that have teeth and belugas are from that family. As you can see on the photos, they have little teeth which allows them to eat um, bigger preys. So they will eat a bunch of different uh, fish, uh, also octopus, sometimes even crustaceans like crabs or smaller ones like shrimp. So in general, uh, where we can find belugas in Canada, so this is a map of Canada. And in the light green, uh, this is all the places we can find belugas. So um, you can see most of them uh, live in the Arctic Ocean. And we have, they're divided in multiple population. So some of them are more east and some of them are more west. And then we have a tiny population that lives in the St. Lawrence River in Quebec. So the Beaufort Sea, those, this is where I went to count belugas. They're found there just above the Northwest Territories. So belugas are well adapted to uh, the Arctic environment. So this means that water is pretty cold. There is a lot of ice going on. So they have a lot of characteristics that allows them to be uh, well adapted. So let's talk about those characteristics. First of all, belugas have white skin. So they are the only whales that have white skin. Um, we don't know exactly for sure why they have evolved with a white skin, but we could guess that they probably help them to camouflage between the ice and the iceberg in the Arctic um, from their predators. Another characteristic is that they don't have a fin on their back. Uh, think about a, a dolphin that has a little fin on their back. Belugas don't have one and actually allows them to be able to break the ice with their back. Um, and by breaking the ice, they can create breeding holes so they can go at the surface and be able to breed air. Another characteristic is that they have big blubber layer to protect them from the cold. So a blubber layer is a big layer of fat just beneath the skin, and it allows them to be isolated from the cold and keep warm inside. And lastly, belugas have a melon head. So a melon head is this very specialized um, organ in their head that uh, is filled with oil and fat and it allows them to create this sound and uh, do echolocation. So you might have heard of echolocation from other animals like bats. Um, so animals can produce sound and they will bounce back on the prey or on other uh, belugas and they can communicate and find food like this. And it's very interesting because it's very squishy. So it's, as I said, it's filled with oil and fat. Uh, so there's no bone. So as you can see, it's pretty soft. Okay, other quick characteristics. Uh, belugas uh, can be as long as 2.5 to 4.5 meters. So you can see on the little photo, it's about twice as big as a human. They can weigh uh, from 0 to uh, 0 0.7 to 1.5 tons, which is about the weight of a rhino. Uh, they can live up to 60 years and they can die from two to 25 minutes at the time. Belugas are also predators in the Arctic. So one uh, animals that we know well from the Arctic is the polar bear. So polar bears are very strong in that they can actually um, eat belugas. Another one is the orcas or the killer whales. And then we also have Inuit. So Inuits are the indigenous communities in the Arctic. And they hunt belugas because when you think about it, living in the Arctic, you can't really grow a garden to grow vegetables or have trees that produce fruits. So you need to rely on other sources of food and the other sources of food are the animals that we found in the Arctic. Um, so Inuits have been hunting belugas and other uh, animals for a very long time, um, but they are very sustainable. So that means they don't take too much and um, they make sure that the population uh, still uh, can grow and be well. Okay, I have a little quiz for you. I know we'll have some questions later, but uh, maybe you can just answer this uh, in the class. 
So what color do you think a baby beluga is? Do you think it's white, gray, or blue? So I'll give you a couple of seconds. Well, what I can do too, Alexander, is I can yep. go to the classes to see what they think. So one by one, I can't oh, yeah, go to our sure. live groups. YouTubers can answer too. But Avica West, Illinois, what do you guys think? What color? Gray. 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 Okay, pretty pretty definitively gray there. What do we think, Alexandra? <laughs> the answer is gray. Good job. So baby belugas are born gray, and then as they grow, they become more white and white. And that actually helps us to, to when we look at belugas from above, uh, if we see a small dark beluga, that means it's a little baby. Okay, I have another question quickly. Um, who do you think is the most related to belugas? Is it the narwhal, the mm. orca, or seal? Mm. So, Mr. Richard Klaus, you guys can chime in too. Madam Poff, we can see what you guys think. Uh, we got a bun bunch of options, all the classes. And then on YouTube, if you guys want to share in a couple more seconds, I'll come to one of our classes. What do we think? Oh, Africa West, I know, but you guys already had a turn. I want to make sure we get as many people in as possible. What do we think? Uh, Madam Poff, what do you think? If you want to unmute your mic, any thoughts from the classes? Hi. So Hi. Uh, looks like we voted mostly for Orca. Okay. They think Orca, Mr. Richards' class. I'll head to you guys. What do you think? Uh, they voted Narwhal. <laughs> Narwhal. And then on, on YouTube, it's Orca. We got Narwhal too. Okay. So we've eliminated Seal. It's Narwhal or Orca. <laughs> What's the answer? I don't know. <laughs> the answer is narwhal. Good job. Um, yes, the so narwhal is the most related to belugas. Um, they're about the same size as belugas. Killer whales are a little bit bigger. And as you can see, they have some of the same characteristics. So uh, you can see that they don't have a dorsal fin, so a fin on their back. And they're also tutted well. I don't have a photo of their teeth, but they are. Um, and actually, belugas and narwhals really like to hang out together. So there was a story of a little narwhal that got lost and find its way to the St. Lawrence River. And as you can see, it, find, it found a group of belugas and now they adopted him. So now the little narwhal lives with belugas in the St. Lawrence, which is really cool. All right, let's go back to my questions of counting how many belugas is in the Beaufort Sea. So counting animals in a population is really in, uh, important for uh, biologists because it allows us to make sure the population is well. Is it growing? Is it declining? Um, are they uh, staying in the same habitat or did they move? Are they following uh, different prey? All of these questions we can, um, can be helped uh, being answered with uh, counting how many um, individuals are in a population. So there are many ways that we can do this. Um, some of the uh, creatures, we can go on the beach and let's say count uh, how many eggs or how many little babies, because they will be uh, not as fast as the adult ones. So we can count them before they go uh, out in the sea. Sometimes the creatures like seals and sea lions will hull out on rocks. So we can actually observe them uh, on the rocks and, and count them like there. If you're not too far from the coast, uh, you can actually go on a boat and look for whales and count them from the boat. And sometimes you even have to go underwater with all your scuba gear and uh, count how many, sometimes it could be uh, starfish or sea cucumbers or even some seaweeds. Uh, we need to go under the sea and really look uh, there. But for belugas, uh, especially in the Arctic, there are uh, over such a large area that just going on a boat would take too much time and too much fuel. So we actually go on a plane and then the plane allows us to go faster and cover a larger area um, so we can count more belugas. So you can see the inside of the plane, um, there's little windows. So we just have to look out the windows and count how many uh, wells we see. So we call this an aerial survey. And there's a couple of steps um, when we uh, do an aerial survey. First of all, we need to plan our routes. So this is uh, just a, a screenshot of an app that we have, and then you can see the track. So this is where we want the plane to go. So we can plan where we wanna go in uh, over the ocean. And then we send this to the pilots of the planes and then the pilots will just 
follow those routes. Whoops. Uh, Second step is to check the weather. So every morning before we go on the plane, we need to check uh, the weather and make sure there's no storm or there's no uh, rain coming. So this is a map of uh, the conditions of uh, the weather conditions. So we need to check with the pilots. We need to check with everyone on the team uh, to make sure, because uh, if you have too much wind, then you have waves and then it's harder to see animals. The third step is once we're, we have the, the go from uh, the weather, we can prepare equipment on the plane. So we have a couple of fancy equipment, so laptops with ads, we have tablets, um, but we also have a camera. Um, so you can see there's a hole on the plane. There's actually a glass, so the, the camera doesn't fall. But we can attach a camera, and the camera will take pictures uh, of what's under the plane while we fly over the ocean. And then we have fancy microphone like this uh, that makes you look like a professional. Uh, and it's the there's a lot of noise when you're on the plane. So this allows you to communicate with each other and also with the pilots. All right. And then we go up in the air and you can see this is me. Uh, this is a video from me flying over the Arctic Ocean. So you can see ice in the water. The conditions are pretty good right now, but we fly over a very different landscape. So sometimes it's very clear, sometimes there's a lot of ice and it's really hard to see animals um, from above. And sometimes it looks almost like the Caribbean, the water is so clear and bright. Um, we could think that we're in the, in the on vacation. All right, so I have a little exercise for you. So now that we are over the, uh, the ocean and then we uh, spot some belugas, we need to count how many we see. So I'll show you three photos. Um, and let's say if you can count how many whales you see from the photos. Mm -hmm. So again, I'll let you a couple of seconds to think. Okay. For, for this one, sorry, it's not just a sample. Okay, all right. So Mr. Richards class, I'm gonna come to you guys first. In a second, take a, take a sec, see how many whales you think. I have an answer that I think, but I'm guessing that I'm terribly wrong. <laughs> it seems too easy. <laughs> Mr. Richards, if you want to come unmute your mic, come chat with me. What do we think? How many whales? Uh, we're thinking four. <laughs> four. That's my pick. Thank you. That gives me hope. Okay. Alexandra, 500. <laughs> All right. Good job. So this oh, one was easy. So you should have counted four belugas. So the good thing with belugas, when you look at them from uh, above, is with the white skin, they really popped in from the water. Okay, now we're gonna go a little more difficult. Ooh. So how many do you think you can see here? Okay, Madam Pav, I'm gonna come to you next, actually. Mavica West, you can wrap us up in a second. Miss Kirk, Miss uh, Nuflis East Class, thank you so much for being in the YouTube chat and sharing in there too. But Madam Pav, what do, what do we think? And if, if your kids are having trouble, what do you think? No pressure at all. Whoa. Uh, the children are thinking four. I, I'm with them. Okay, Alexandra. Right. What do you think? Okay, so we have two over there, and then we actually have three here. So I think Whoa. you may have missed number five because yeah. uh, it's a little baby, so it's darker and it's smaller. Uh, but there's actually five. So the the little, the actually the the adult white belugas here. It's probably its mother, and then the baby. Um, is swimming very close to its mother. Okay, last one. This one is the most difficult one because on that day there were some waves. So now it makes it a little harder to observe um, mm -hmm. to spot the belugas. Okay, Avaka West, I'm coming to you guys in a second. I'm going to get Madam Poth. I saw four, and that the fifth one is really hard. The gray guy we discovered the babies earlier. Avaka West, Illinois, what do we think? Fingers, hold up your fingers. Four, five, six, four, I see five, six. Four, five, I see four, four, five, and six. Four, five, and six. Okay, so somewhere in that range. Please go. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> all right, so the answer is actually four. So all the other white spots that were you saw or thought it was belugas is actually waves. It's little white caps from waves. So this one is a little tricky. So it gets harder and harder depending on uh, the weather conditions. 
All right, so let's say we've counted all uh, the belugas that we saw. So this is a map of all the places that we've been. So um, as I, tell, I told you, the lines here are the tracks. So this is where the planes flew and we uh, observed belugas. And all the little dots that you can see are where we saw belugas. And the little different colors means uh, if we saw uh, just one or sometimes if we saw uh, little babies or if we saw big groups. So now that we have all of this, we actually need to do some maths and that sometimes doing science and being a marine biologist mean you have to do some maths because obviously you didn't really count every single beluga. Some of them were probably on the water when you flew over on the plane and some um, you may have, uh, you didn't fly over every single uh, spots where belugas could have been. So you need to do some proportion and some math, but I have the final number of how many belugas I think there is in the Beaufort Sea. And the answer is 40,000 belugas. So this is a really big population. It's actually one of the biggest population we have in Canada. And 40,000 beluga means they're actually doing really well. Um, this is a, a good population. They're um, stable, so uh, there's uh, no big problem. So they're not going to go extinct uh, soon. Although there are some threats to belugas. And if we don't take care of those threats, those numbers might decline. And we can see the population um, not doing so great. So. Things like climate change, uh, we have global warming. That means the Arctic especially is warming up quite fast. Uh, so the water is getting warmer, the ice is melting. So this changed all the habitat of belugas and it affects the food, it affects the predators, it affects a whole bunch of different things. Um, and um, it's not really great for belugas. The other thing too is plastic. So we know that there's a lot of plastic in the ocean. And sometimes even if the plastic is more around the big cities down south, uh, just with the uh, currents from the ocean, the plastic goes all the way up to the Arctic. And now we found plastic in fish and also in belugas. So this is not really good. And finally, if uh, there is less ice, that means there's more ship that can go in the Arctic. And the thing with ship is that they produce a lot of sound on the water. So with the turbine and everything, it creates a lot of sound. And this interferes with echolocation of belugas. So uh, they have difficulties to communicate with each other or sometimes to find food. Um, so all of this are part of the threats. Um, and we are working on solutions, but you can also do your part. So you can help take care of the environment. So, you know, put uh, your recycle uh, in the right bins, put your litter in the, the garbage. Uh, you can also reduce the plastic that you're using so there's less plastic in the ocean. Uh, you can try to walk or bike or take the bus uh, as much as you can. Uh, I know sometimes it's not possible and you have to take the car, but when you can, why not? And then you can also encourage your family and friend to do so. So talk about uh, the belugas to your family and talk about belugas in, to your friends and try to encourage them to help uh, the belugas too. And with that, uh, I thank you all for listening and I'm really uh, excited to hear all your questions. Oh, Alexander, that was an amazing <laughs> presentation. Thank you so, so much for that. I'll give you a second to come out of screen share and I'll just note for our YouTube friends, Ms. Kurt's class, Ms. New Lizzie's class, if you guys want to share questions there, if there's any other teachers that want to share questions, we'd love to hear from you. Our live classes, I'm coming to you all in a second. You can put your thinking caps on for a minute. Um, and I'm going to take some questions from YouTube to begin. So Jackson wants to know, when the melon head is pushed back and forth, like in the GIF you showed, does that hurt the whale at all? <laughs> That's a good question. So you shouldn't really touch it. Uh, this was done in an aquarium, so they were very familiar with the whales, uh, but it actually doesn't hurt. It's like, you know, pushing on your cheek, like it's very soft. Um, so, you know, it doesn't hurt, but we shouldn't really touch animals just to make sure that we don't push too far because then, then it can hurt the whales. Yeah. I did. I was waiting the entire time in that answer for which body part you were going to choose to push. Okay. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, mm, what just, yeah, well, I guess the, the cheeks. <laughs> um, we don't have a big, 
melon head to to test it out. So we do not. I, I hope that no one has a melon head in the audience if we've offended you terribly. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Richards class, I'm gonna head to you guys first and average for you. Uh come on in, unmute your mic, and you're good to go. So tell us. Hey guys. Hey, uh Jack's coming up with a question. Hey, Jack. <laughs> Do you put trackers on the belugas to find them on like the, you know, that's, you know. Yeah, like a GPS track or something like that. Awesome. Great question. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, they actually do. So um, we don't put it on all belugas because obviously 40,000 belugas are a lot. And the little GPS that we put on the whales are very expensive. So um, we usually put it on about 10 whales um, and then we can follow those whales. Uh, there's... There was actually a colleague of mine when I was at the university that was um, working on looking at those trucks and see where belugas um, are going. Uh, it's pretty impressive because they go very far and they travel miles and miles. <laughs> uh, Avoca West, Glenview, if you guys have a query for us, come on in. We're like, this is like the best earliest Q&A we've had in so long. This is great. We have lots of time for questions. Hey. Um, how is it? How is like the background of being a marine biologist? Ooh. What is the background? Yeah, how do you get where you are? What do you take in school? Tell us more about it. Mm, that's yeah, that's interesting. Um, so um, when I go to university, uh, I chose a program called marine science. So in marine science, uh, I learned every well, and not everything. I learned a lot of different <laughs> things about. Uh, uh, marine biology. So sometimes you can learn about um, more of the chemistry. So like how all the chemicals work in the ocean. You can do more like physics. So more maths, like how waves are created and how there's a lot of in phenomena that are happening at the same time in the ocean. Um, I chose more of the path with biology. So biology is studying animals and plants, all the living things. So then we learn from little tiny crustacean and plankton to giant whale. Um, so we learn all the things uh, in between. Um, obviously, there's um, different like you, you need to love science. You need to love asking questions. You need to um, there's a little bit of math, as I said. So um, sometimes uh, it's not the best part, but we have to do it. Um, and then like just liking animals and liking the being outside and by the water. Oh, what a great answer. And I'm so <laughs> glad we get that question. Every time we hear it, I always love it. Um, Adam Pops group, Petawawa, uh, our young ones today. If you want to unmute your mic, come on in. Any question you have on behalf of your kids. Oui, bonjour, Alexandra. Harry, hello from the Ottawa Valley. We're very close hey. to where you're from and get to know. Yes. So my virtual JKSK1 class, Chase and Riley would like to know, have you ever swam and touched a beluga whale? And are you scared of beluga whales? Mm. I haven't swam with beluga whales because in the Arctic, the water is pretty cold. So <laughs> um, I, did I did do a little dive in the ocean, Arctic Ocean, when I was doing the field work. And it was, I think it lasted three seconds. I dipped in and dipped out. <laughs> it was enough. Um, so I didn't really swim with the belugas. Um, and especially when you go out in uh, on the field and in the wildlife, uh, you want to uh, do as less possible as interaction. So you don't want to really touch animals in the wild. You want to leave them. Um, so so we were just observing them from above, from the from the plane. Yeah, and, and then I'm, 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 I'm not scared. No. <laughs> I'm not scared <laughs> of the lucas. <laughs> they're really uh, they're great animals. Um, they're not really like they're not gonna attack you or anything. Um, they attack small fish, so you're not a threat <laughs> to them. Nice. I will note too a couple things. Metapop, your virtual school shirt is the greatest shirt I've seen in all of the last three years for someone online. So way to go. Uh, and two, in Churchill, Manitoba, which we've talked about in some of the other Beluga broadcasts, um, you there is a stand-up paddleboard option that you can go mm -hmm. with belugas. And I've seen footage of the whale knocking the person off the stand-up paddleboard. So that's the closest <laughs> I've seen to someone swimming with belugas, uh, inadvertently, yeah. shall we say. Yeah, um, a tr Churchill is a, a special place because belugas are almost uh used to human because they're they're so close so they do get very close to the the boats and to the paddle boards and it gets pretty cool yeah 
Awesome. All right. We're going to take a few questions from our YouTube friends, and then we're going to go back for another round with our live groups. Miss Kerr's class from Cedar, the greatest name so far in the whole broadcast, with echolocation, what's the maximum distance they can hear? Is there like oh. a limit to that that we know? Yeah, um, we actually don't know exactly. Uh, it's pretty far, so they can almost hear like kilometers away. Um, but it will depend on very different uh, things in uh, the environment. So if they're in shallow water, that means the sound can go uh, further. If they're in very deep water, uh, the sound will um, reach shorter distance. Um, there's also if the water is very clear and there's not a lot of particle, um, then the sound can be uh, can prolong uh, transmit longer, uh, yeah. and if there's a lot of particle, if it's very like busy in uh, the water, then uh, the sound kind of gets interfered or the um, the sound wave gets interfered. So it it really depends, but it's pretty far. It's like a couple of kilometers away. So wow, that's. Wow, what a great question, guys. All right, Ms. McAdams' class, grade two, is joining us in Kingston, one of my favorite places in Canada. What do they eat? What's the Beluga oh. oil diet? Hmm. So the favorite food of Belugas is Arctic cod. So it's a fish that we can find in the Arctic, but they will also eat other fish like capelin and Dolly Varden. And mm -hmm. as I said, they also eat sometimes uh, octopus and crabs. It's a very varied seafood diet. Sounds delicious. Yep. <laughs> um, we're going to head back to Amherst to you, Mr. Richard's class. If you guys have another one for us, come on in. Hey. Um, how do you like, what do you have to calculate to get the math of how much belugas there are? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things we need to consider. So we need to calculate how much time belugas are uh, underwater. So how much time or what's the proportion of time they spend at the surface versus underwater. So then we can, let's say they spend half of the time underwater, then that means we see about 50% of the belugas at the surface. Then yeah, you need to multiply by two to calculate how many you missed that were underwater. There's also um, maths where um, you need to calculate what's the area that you uh, flew over with your plane. And then what's the area you want to know about all the habitat of belugas. So if you, let's say, again, if you flew only 50% of their habitat, that means you missed half of uh, the potential belugas. So you can, all again, multiply by two. Um, so there's a lot of little details like this, but this is overall uh, the maths that we do. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to take a question from YouTube from a teacher that I've been brutally butchering the name of for quite some time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Nipoglese's class, uh, for correcting me in the chat. Now your kids will laugh when I say it ever, ever again. Uh, Bella wants to know a great question. How do you make sure you don't count the whales more than once? That's a really good question. Um, so that's something um, that we try to consider. Um, but uh, basically, the, the, the plane goes like a lot faster than the whale. So we move a lot more faster than the whale. So the chances that a whale moves as fast and then uh, we meet it again, it's pretty low. So that's why we, we, we assume we don't count it twice. Okay. Uh, Avika West, Glenview, come on in for B. Hey. Um, how much does weather affect the belugas when they're swimming? Nice mm. That's a good question. Um, actually, when they are storms, um, so sometimes in the Arctic there's a, a storms, and then it means like there's a lot of waves and there's a lot of wind. So belugas try um, to go uh, in like shallow little bays um, so they are more protected. They'll even go like up rivers. So we found belugas that went up rivers, especially with their little babies, because then they can kind of escape the storm and it's more uh, calm and, and the babies can swim better. Otherwise, it's hard to, for babies to go at the surface and, and breathe when there's a lot of waves. So that's a good question. Really good question. This has been such a fun Q&A for me. You guys are really like on it today. Um, Madam Poff, I'm going to head back to you guys. Uh, JK through one, come on in. Take us away. Hey. Bonjour. So Marilyn would like mm -hmm. to know, have you ever seen a narwhal? And Riley wants to know if you think beluga whales are cool. 
<laughs> I do think beluga whales are cool. I have a, I have a, even like a, a little plush of belugas in my bed right now. So I think they're cool. Um, I haven't seen a narwhals and I've worked um, on narwhals project, but the narwhals lives more on the east. So the Beaufort Sea is more on the west of the Arctic and there's no narwhals in that area. All the narwhals are on the east of the Arctic. So I haven't been there, um, but I've worked on um, some data that we collected on narwhals, um, but they're really cool. They have like the big tusk and they're really cool to work uh, on and really interesting to learn more about them. Yeah, awesome. Great question. By the way, nice dab, Madam Pop, in the background. Miss <laughs> um, Girk's class, Senia wants to know, how big do beluga pods get? Super Ooh, cool. Yes. yes. So this is something that I actually worked on um, during uh, when I was at the university. So usually groups of belugas can be as small as two uh, and then sometimes go up to 10 and 20. So they're relatively small, but then in the summer early, sometimes they have big aggregation. So all the little groups of belugas all come together and then they can be like thousands of belugas in one place. So we see this uh, in the Beaufort Sea, um, but it's really hard to take photos because there's so many <laughs> and uh, it's really hard to count. So, um, but yeah, they can go up to hundreds and thousands of belugas in one place. But then after this, they break up again and they're smaller groups. We are going to take a question from YouTube and then we're going to do a whole other round, which is the first time I've had a three round program in like a long time. So Alexander, you are a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Miss McAdams class wants to know how large are the adult whales, how long and how heavy? We want all the superlatives. Lay it on us. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you remember in the presentation, I showed like a photo and you, you could see like a little scuba diver next to a beluga. So they're, they can go up to about 4.5 meters. So this is quite big. Um, I don't know exactly what would be an equivalent, um, but they can also be as heavy as a rhino. So like 1.5 tons. So they're pretty heavy, but when they are in the water, the water helps them to float and it's buoyant. So they're only heavy on land. <laughs> great question, guys. All right, one final round together. Time flies and you're having fun. We've had so many great queries so far. And again, if you want to check out more Beluga stuff, head to our YouTube channel, see the amazing programs in the last couple of weeks. But this has been a really special one today. Uh, Mr. Richards, come on in and take us away. Okay. <laughs> How fast do Beluga whales move? Ooh, mm. please be Oh, this is a good question. Um, they are, um, I think, uh, this is, I would say they, they don't swim super fast. So um, they're really more like a chill whale. So they, they are pretty slow and then go at the surface, breathe and go down. Um, but I think it's about 10 seconds per meters. So I don't know. No, that means the four, four meters. I don't know. I, I could get back to you on this. This is a good question. I don't know exactly the number. You know what? I like the, the fact that you said they're a pretty chill whale just makes the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> uh, Illinois, we're heading back to you and Madam Paul. We'll wrap up with you in just a second, but come on in. Just look at Can belugas be different colors based on habitat and melanin? Ooh. Mm. So I haven't seen belugas of other colors than white. So they're always white. Um, except when they're uh, little babies. Uh, but that's a good question because there are some other animals that change colors depending on their habitat. And um, you know what, when the belugas that lives in the St. Lawrence, you know, there's, there's no ice or there's no, it's not the Arctic in the St. Lawrence, but they're still white. So they've evolved a long time ago to uh, adapt to a certain environment of the Arctic, but the population that ended up in the St. Lawrence just stayed white and so far, <laughs> it's going well. How neat is that? Uh, this has been so much fun for me, honestly. Uh, Madam Pops class, come on in with one final query, and we will wrap up from there and give Alexandra a true finale that uh, she deserves for our Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants program. It's her first time with us, so get ready for the big cheer. But Madam Pops, Merci. one final query. <laughs> oui, bonjour. So uh, Riley, sorry. Um, Riley, yes, Riley wants to know, do beluga whales just live in the Arctic? And Chase wants to know, is it your favorite type of whale? And Marilyn wants to know, what are sea cucumbers? 
<laughs> good okay, good questions. Okay, so um, uh, belugas live in the Arctic, but as I said, um, they also live in the Arctic, like all around. So not just in Canada, so, um, we can find them in Alaska, in Russia, and in Norway. So all the Arctic, other countries that have uh, Arctic water. And then, as I said, the, the most southern uh, population lives in the St. Lawrence. So this is in Quebec. So this is the most south you can see belugas. And um, the second question was uh, if belugas are cool. <laughs> Which one? Uh, yeah. Oh, I got your back. Sorry. Here we go. Yes. Oh, there is we it, go. Is, are belugas your favorite type of whale? Oh, yes. Oh, uh, they are. They are my favorite types of whale because uh, yeah. I've worked on them for so long that um, I got to know them um, really well and, and learn more about it. it so, so just so cool. Um, and then sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers are really cool creatures. So. They're an invertebrates, so they don't have any bones in their body. And they live on the ocean floor. Um, and maybe you remember from the first picture I showed you, they have this kind of like tentacles coming out of their body. Um, and they can, they have like kind of like arms uh, that acts, um, that can capture little particles in the water. And then they bring their arms back into their mouth and that's how they feed. Um, so I was studying them um, to see how much, how how they grow and how they they evolve. Uh, in the, we can find them in the Saint Lawrence again, um, but they're really strange looking creature for sure. <laughs> they certainly are. What a great bunch of questions, guys! Thank you all so so much, um, Alexander. Before we wrap up, is there any final message you want to leave with our kids about your work, how they can keep the learning going? Uh, your last slide was so great about ways that they can take action to help protect belugas. But uh, if there's anything else you want to dive in with. Go for it. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would just say if you're interested in doing some marine biology, just um, try to look for a science program or um, maybe you, you will have to go a little further uh, in universities that are closer to the water, but it's a really cool uh, job that we, you can do. Outstanding. Alex, mm -hmm. what you doing? And every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teachers to say a big thank you and farewell. Miss uh, Nifaglees, Miss uh, McAdam, Miss Kirk on YouTube. If you guys want to chime in and scream wherever you are too as well, we'd love that. But come mm -hmm. on in, Mr. Richards, Avika West, Madam Boff. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>